So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Douglas Sullivan. I'm the lead engineer for the Center for Western Weather and Water Street. And I've uh, been chairing the Scripps Technical Forum for quite a long time. It's probably you came to your last day. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I really appreciate you all attending today. We have a great team from CBER that's going to allow us with some of their instrumentation to tell us how to record our science here at Scripps. And I get uh, you know, a lot of the the scheduling uh, logistics is taken care of by Vanessa and Kenny, and I, I really appreciate that because it really makes this a vibrant event for the community. And I would just add that if you have ideas of other you know, research that you're working on in your lab, because this is not just bringing in corporate uh, uh, entities, this is often about the research we do here. If there's ideas you would like to share uh, to the technical community here at Scripps, please. Let us know. Um, we, we really like to, and it doesn't have to be polished. This is not. Um, I'm going to a conference type thing. This is just like, hey, I'm in this great idea. But please let us know. Or if there are companies that you feel uh, other members of our community could benefit from, please let us know as well. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. And looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say it's an honor to be giving a technical forum at the top tier oceanographic institute in the United States. So thank you very much for having me and our team. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, using the ACS, which is on the table, as a tool to improve our understanding of life in the ocean. And um, the title has the rainbow of ocean life. And what, what I'm, I would try to bring out in this is that the instrument is hyperspectral and it is measuring most of the visible spectrum of light. And this allows us to see what is in the ocean and understand the constituents of the water at high resolution. So what, what am I gonna to cover today? Today I'm gonna to cover a little bit about Seabird Scientific and provide a brief introduction, inter, introduction about uh, who we are and, and our great team here at Scripps. I'm gonna provide an overview of water column optic properties and give a general um, overview of light in water. I'm gonna cover our optical instrument portfolio. And finally, I'll cover the attributes of the ACS, which is why we're here today, and discuss the, um, the advancement we have in the new LED launch. And then I'm gonna hopefully be providing an inspirational story with some research that's been recently done with the ACS as a tool, um, in terms of understanding ocean, the constituents of water, and a phytoplankton community. And so I'll talk about the applications of using the ACS um, in, in the field. So who are we? My name is Chris Arrigo, and I'm the program manager for Seabird Scientific. And my job is actually to work on bringing uh, and building partnerships with uh, outside uh, scientific groups uh, to bring in new technologies and new product development to Seabird. Um, and I started actually as a field technician 17 years ago uh, at the organization, I've been there ever since. Um, I, I actually started um, really being interested in optics because I wanted to see what was in the water, but I, um, while I love seeing it under a microscope, I thought that was too small a snapshot. And so being able to use optical instruments allows me to see a little bit more um, broadly what's, what's making up the water constituents. And so I have on my left. Hi, I'm Dave Stalke. Um, I work with the tech support in customer service, um, ha have not always done that. Um, I started about 25 years ago. I just thinking that in two weeks I'll have been <laughs> around for 25 years at Wet Labs. Ah, uh, but that's how it started with Wet Labs, um, where I started with the service and production teams, and uh, but that was coming off of having a couple summer internships in oceanography at Oregon State. And that um, pretty much hooked me with oceanography. So I was thinking, gosh, how the heck am I going to do that? You know, so I had to get a real job, worked for HP for a while, always wanting to get back towards that summer internship where we did some fun uh, research uh, with uh, tagging of whales. So we did satellite tagging. So that was kind of cool. Uh, but of course, that um, I didn't want to ever leave that, but um, reality hit. A little fast forward, Wet Labs came into view, so I was able to jump into that realm of oceanography. And so after we consolidated with Seabird Electronics for to be scientific, uh, 
is when I started doing the tech support stuff. So I want to, I guess I just want to make sure that uh, everyone knows they have a partner. Um, we, I really enjoy the challenges um, of getting everyone up and running and doing this very important work that you guys do. And um, so I just hope that comes through in our interactions. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Oops, I didn't want to remove Dave now. Yeah, Jochen. I'm uh, Jochen Brinke, I'm Director of Science at Seabird. Joined Seabird about six years ago and uh, actually I had a, quite a few years here at Scripps myself uh, uh, in, the, in the 90s, you know, <laughs> so uh, mostly dealing with CTDs and that made kind of the connection to Seabird. So I'm kind of in charge of leading the science team and collaborating with outside researchers. A lot of the instruments we develop uh, result from that collaboration that's really necessary. Super uh, happy to be here. So. Thanks, Douglas, um, uh, for having us today. And we also have uh, Lindsay, our marketing manager here behind the camera. So she is responsible for a lot of the organization. Uh, she's joined recently at Seabird. Super thankful to have her being here. Two years today. Um, nice one. Excellent. Wow. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm just going to um, play a little video that also helps just give an overview of what Seabird Scientific is. One of the things that I really think that everyone should understand about the ocean is that no matter how far away from the ocean you are, it affects your life. It controls the weather. It's where we get our food from. And also, we depend on it for our health. No matter how far away from the ocean you are, it does impact your life. People don't understand the oceans because you don't see it. Right? We, we fly, we can see the air, we can kind of be above the ground, we kind of understand clouds. But not many people go underwater and understand the oceans. At Seabird Scientific, we design and build oceanographic instrumentation used around the globe by researchers and scientists. Our customers work on the leading edge of ocean science. This science relies on Seabird Scientific instruments. The data we generate increases understanding and shapes policy. We enable these critically important global research projects and are proud to play a part in powering science-based decisions for a better ocean. This company has a reputation for extremely reliable, extremely accurate instrumentation. It's been said a number of times that Seabird is the gold standard of instrumentation. My favorite part about working at Seabird Scientific is working with a team to solve really complex and really hard problems. What's different about Seabird is the way we work together, from our research scientists to our associates putting the instruments together, to our sales team, our marketing team, and everyone wants to do the best for Seabird. So what I like most about working at Seabird is that you get to see a product from start to finish and then also that relationship that we have with customers. You get to see the direct impact of the choices that you're making and the products that you're making, and you really get to feel that what you're doing is having an impact on other people's careers and the research that we're doing. As a senior physical oceanographer at Seabird, one of my biggest jobs is to actually make your data better. The calibration is the core piece that makes our instruments accurate and makes the measurements in the field accurate. What makes our calibration special here at Seabird is that we have an in-house metrology lab, so we're able to trace our measurements back to physical standards, and we also take the time to calibrate each sensor individually. Metrology is fundamental to making our sensors useful and making them accurate, and especially if you want to look at changes related to climate, you have to have a very, very, very high degree of accuracy because the ocean is so large that even a small change can be significant. The level of care that we have to make our calibrations accurate is really fundamental to having that quality of data that is needed. But at the end of the day, it's what are we doing? Because what we serve is a very important customer base. These are customers that are scientists and researchers that are really trying to understand what's going on in the world. What is our next generation going to be faced with? With climate change, ocean problems, feeding out of the ocean, food. And so for me, you know, when I go to bed at night, am I happy for what I'm doing and 
broader impact I'm having on the world. And that's important to me and I think to a lot of the people at Safer. So I actually just want to come back around to what Dave said, and I wanted to just highlight again that we are a partnership, even you know, with, with purchase of the instruments, we want to make sure we're supporting the scientists that are using the equipment that we are selling. So we're going to jump into light and water, and I actually wanted to steal a picture from um, right offshore, but um, just imagine the surf today, it's a little uh, turbid out, and the water's different, it's not bright blue, it's sort of this greenish yellow. And I think it's really important to consider, um, you know, the color of the ocean varies based on the constituents that are in it. And even by observation from today, there's information in the water um, just from its color. We can take a deeper dive by measuring the water column op optical properties. And this really involves measuring the light field and the changes depending on the composition of water and its constituents. The next few, I'm sorry, in the next few slides, I'll provide more detail on what happens to light in the environment. But basically, light is lost as it is attenuated as a function of depth. That lost light is either absorbed or scattered. And depending on the composition of the water, it attenuates light differently in the visible spectrum. So let's take a deeper dive. So what I can show here is that light is attenuated. So if you look at the visible spectrum of light coming from the sun, there's a lot and it's a full spectrum. So as light enters the water, it is reduced and the spectrum changes. And so the light is expen exponentially decreasing as a function of depth and is changing its spectra, meaning that different parts of that visible uh, light spectrum are decreased. So this is actually called attenuation and it's denoted C. And there are two fates for light and it's A, absorption, or B, scattering. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more on what this is. So scattering, B. Light is redirected, and there are several ways in which light is scattered in the water. It's scattered by water, scattered by phytoplankton, which are particles. It's scattered by non-algal particles or sediments. Light is also absorbed, A. It's absorbed by water, it's absorbed by phytoplankton, and it's absorbed by chromic dissolved organic matters. And I think it's really important to make sure that when we are measuring absorption and attenuation, we're looking at that full visible spectrum of light, and that provides us insight into what is in the water, the constituents of water. So again, light varies as a function of wavelength. And as you can see here, the spectrum of light, as it's decreasing in the euphotic zone, changes its spectra. And so red light, is absorbed and in, in clear water, right? So think like Caribbean, um, it's gonna be clear water and the water itself is really contributing to that absorption of that red light. And so that's why red light decreases much faster um, as a function of depth than blue light. And not only that, but clear water scatters really efficiently in the blue. And that's the reason why water looks blue in clear waters. And that's why blue light really does do a very good job of penetrating deep into the euphotic zone. And there are several ways in which we measure the optical properties, and each one of them can provide information into the composition of the ocean waters. All right, and I'll get back to my example. So today the water looked green, and if we look at how different particles are um, absorbing different regions of the spectrum, we can consider that the sediments that are, that are being resuspended are actually really good at absorbing in the blue. And so it's going to shift the spectrum of light that we see coming from the ocean into the green. So again, we're gonna measure optical properties and we're gonna learn more about what's in the ocean because of that. So let's talk about our optical instrument portfolio. Seabird offers a lot of tools that measure those water column optical properties. Okay, so here's our first tool. We're gonna to look at hyperspectral ocean color radiometers and these are used to measure the light field. So Dave's holding up, here's my cheat. Dave's holding up an irradiance sensor and I love this because if you look at the diffuser, its job is to measure the diffuse light field over the hemisphere. And that's really uh, used in order to understand how much light is coming into the ocean. 
One of the other sensors that we have is a, is a radiance sensor, it's a radiometer, and it'll be facing downward. And what it's looking at is a narrow um, column of light, like um, as if you were to look through a paper towel tube, and it's looking down, and its job is to measure the amount and direction and spectra of light coming out of the ocean. In order to, to, to work with those two parameters, you can look at remote sensing reflectance. And so looking at that ratio, you're looking at how much light is coming in, what happens, how much light is coming out, and it can actually be re sensed remotely uh, from a satellite. Okay, partnerships. This is really cool because we're actually working with a group of people who are deploying, I think next week, one of these systems. So this is a dual-headed radiometer that we're working with in partnership with NASA, with University of Maine, and with Scripps and ourselves to develop a new tool that is an on a, a, a dual-headed radiometer that actually um, is deployed on an autonomous vehicle. And in this sense, it's deployed on a Navis. This system sits right under the water column about 20 centimeters deep and is measuring light out of the water. Its job will become the new calibration sensor for the PACE ocean color satellite that will be launched in 2024. And so we're hoping, and we've, we've, uh, we've demonstrated this uh, in several deployments now, we're hoping to have a fleet of them operational well before the satellite's launched and well after it's, it's um, launched at first light. So this is a really cool new work that we're doing. Um, some of the other ways to measure light, well, that could be like an ECO or an MCOMS. And in this case, light is emitted into the environment in order to understand the receipt, the receiver or the receipt of the signal. And, and in the case of the MCOMS and the ECO, we can measure chlorophyll A we can measure a color dissolved organic material. And that's usually from a uh, change in, in excite. Uh, so we give a blue light for excitation and we're looking back at the red light received to, in order to learn more about the environment. These sensors also have um, a scattering sensor on it. So we're looking again at the backward scattered of, scatter of light from the emitted light that we put in the ocean. We also have um, the, the transmissometers such as the single wavelength C star. And, oh, I thought it came up, the uh, ACS. And so that's again, the attenuation and uh, absorption sensor. And that's the hyperspectral think rainbow version. And again, A and C are in its name. So it's kind of a dead giveaway. We also have a UBAT. And so UBAT actually measures light but it measures light from mechanically stimulating the organisms to produce light. And we measure that with a photomultiplier tube. <clears throat> so now let's focus a little bit deeper on the ACS. And so we're recently, we recently worked with in improving the light source. And so we have a new LED light source that is far, stable than, far more stable than the incandescent light that we uh, had originally on the sensor. And so we're gonna focus on how the ACS can be used to differentiate water column optical properties. And a little bit more about what's different between the two systems or between the two, two sensors. So the ACS has two flow paths, again, an A and a C. So at the same time, it's measuring the absorption and attenuation of light um, at, at concurrently. It has two path lengths as an option. So you can either buy a 10 centimeter or a 25. And so the 10 centimeter is really for extremely turbid coastal systems that want, uh, where you would have um, a multiple scattering event. So most of the time you're going to be using a 25 centimeter uh, system, but in, but in very turbid waters, the 10 centimeter is best. Again, it measures high resolution. So it, this, system measures about 85 different wavelengths of light in both A and C at the same time. And it, and it makes this measurement very quickly at a four hertz sampling, right? So there's no real, there's no smearing of data and it's really very good at, at making sure it's not aliasing the signals. So let's talk about the science behind the ACS. So measuring light and, and attenuation is based on detecting light transmitted through a path length of water. So this is just a distance and a volume of water. And the light measures, is, uh, 
the light is measured, sorry, I will highlight this. Remember the rainbow of light. So we're basically taking that light and we're breaking it apart. And so we're, we're doing this really quickly that each wavelength is measured across that path length and detected at a detector. Now, what's really important to keep in mind is that we're looking at the light that is transmitted through this. And it's really important because I'm going to um, highlight a few other ways in which how we get at, at absorption and attenuation, because we're not actually directly measuring it. We're measuring light that is transmitted through um, a volume of water. And we also have a reference detector. And so really the, the key take home with this is that our system is set up in a way that we're ensuring that any light that is transmitted is, is or lost um, because of scattering absorption is because of the constituents in the water and not due to a change in the light source. So we're making sure that this is a true measurement. And so this is a very uh, easy way to remember this, that A or C is really the inverse of the signal over the reference. So we're making um, a differential measurement over that path length. And I'll go into greater detail on this because this is a very simplified version. It's not really the appropriate equation, but it gives you a general sense. And just to let you know that because it's measured over path length, the units are in inverse meters. So how does the ACS make your measurement? Remember, there's two sides. So we're going to talk about the C side. The C side has a collimated detector and it's looking for at a very narrow field of acceptance in order to make sure that it's looking at a, a very specific amount of light. It has a non-reflective flow tube and a black material, meaning that any light that makes it to the detector is transmitted and any light that is either attenuated or absorbed is, is or I'm sorry, is scattered, is scattered into the black reflective material. And so that light that is lost is the light that is not transmitted. So it's kind of um, opposite. So again, that the, the attenuation side is really looking at the inverse of the transmitted signal. So the A side is a little different in that it's using a very large detector to, to detect any possible light. And it has a reflecting material inside the detection tube. And so, I'm sorry, inside the, the flow tube. And Dave's giving an example of it. It looks like a really great mirror. And its job is actually to take light and funnel it to the detector. So anything that is scattered is scattered back into the medium and makes it to the detector. So what we're really measuring is transmitted light and scattered light but again, if you look at the inverse of that, you will obtain the absorbed light. Oh, right. And again, it's doing this at 85 wavelengths really fast for, e for a measure of each wavelength um, to understand what's in the water. So what's the difference between the incandescent version and the new LED version. And I think it's really important to say that there's a, about a 2x increase in the lifetime. So the original lamp lasted about 5,000 hours. Now the new lamp operational lifetime is 10,000 hours. Um, the radiant power in this system is about three times that of the incandescent bulb. And so we're really getting an improved measurement precision and improved signal to noise ratio, especially in the blue region of the spectrum. And I'll get into that. You'll see what blue region of the spectrum looks like. And, and this is an improvement over the previous version, which was weak in this area. And so that also really means that there's a, high, a very high stable stability in this blue section, which is actually where some of the really cool stuff for understanding water column optical properties is. It uses about half the power and um, for those who have ACSs, uh, it's backwards compatible with the previous version. So let's take a look at some of the data and I'll explain and I'll show really in the data where um, the improved signal is. And so if you look at this, this is actually um, the okay. incandescent light. So this is absorption that's averaged over 13,000 samples, a period of eight days. This was used as an inline system. So the new LED is in red and the incandescent LED is in black. 
And I think the thing that's really important to keep in mind is that the data shows that there's an improved precision in the blue region of the spectrum, especially between 400 and, 400 and 470 nanometers of light. Um, and this is a, a substantial improvement because what happens here is that you can more clearly differentiate the contribution of the constituents within that part of the spectrum. So it gives more information. We also improved the signal to noise ratio. And so if you can see the difference between the new LED light and the incandescent light, this is the absorption spectra, again, divided by its standard deviation. And so what you're, what you're looking here is that the average data um, is improved in signal to noise and ultimately the sensitivity of the instrument. And this is, again, in a region where the previous version didn't perform as well. So what can you do with the ACS? There's lots of things that you can do, and there's lots of applications. So you can measure total chlorophyll A, chromic dissolved organic matter, particulate, carbon, particle distribution, particle size composition. You can measure the, uh, you can validate ocean color data because that, and some of the data products that are being derived from the ocean color sensor are actually absorption and attenuation. And then you can look at phytoplankton functional types. Okay, this is where my heart is, and this is actually the case study that I'm gonna outline for you now, because I really love phytoplankton. And again, as I told you before, I really wanted to understand what's in the water, but I really thought that I could do it more than using just a microscope. Okay, are there any questions before I go into the application? Go ahead. There's actually a relationship that uses the line height of the 676 absorption, and, and there's a relationship between chlorophyll A and that measurement. And I can go into greater detail when we work through the appendix, but the, there's a paper by um, Rossler and Barnard, I think it came out in 2013, that describes that relationship. And it, it's doing this as a proxy, um, but it's, it's a really good alternative to chlorophyll fluorescence to look at the biomass. It is possible. Some of the questions uh, were how to compare eco. We're doing this for the recording. We just want to make sure the question is clear on the recording. Um, that the uh, if there's a way to compare some of the instruments that are looking at chlorophyll, uh, and that's an answer is yes. And then um, what was the other question? We'll get it. Yeah, we'll get more. Okay, cool. So now the really awesome part. Okay. Oh. oh. My part. We actually have a little bit of swag here, so. Oh, right. It's going to be rewarded with that. <laughs> you. That doesn't mean you just have to ask questions. But. <laughs> yes, exactly. Here we go. So. I really want to highlight a, a great example of, of ACS in, in sort of in the real, real use case. Um, the RV Tara is a really unique opportunity for oceanographic measurements. And this is from Tara Oceans. This is a schooner that is actually traversing the world, making um, scientific uh, oceanographic measurements. And uh, the ACS has had a special opportunity to ride along. This has this through this opportunity we've had continuous we've there's been able to continue uh, collect continuous global data and so about six ACSs were involved in collecting about six months of of continuous data and so um, they were a, about every few weeks they were um, cleaned and. Uh, and reinserted in the inline system that was on this ship, as well as making sure that they uh, changed them out and had them serviced at, at a reasonable frequency. Um, this covered a really large area of the globe, and we were able to, they were able to obtain um, total absorption by particulates over a really large swath of, of the water, of ocean, as well as uh, particulate uh, scattering and, uh, and attenuation. And um, there is an enormous group that is associated with uh, Tara Oceans, um, and some of the information that we'll be showing today um, will be from Guillerme Bourdine, uh, Emmanuel Boss, and Ali Chase. So what 
the data that was collected on Tara did was utilize um, 12 different Gaussian curves that encompassed uh, peak wavelengths to describe chlorophyll A, chlorophyll C, I'm sorry, chlorophyll B, chlorophyll C, uh, uh, photo, uh, photoprotective carotenoids and photosynthetic carotenoids. And then they added a, a peridinin peak as well as a non-algal particle peak, which this is right here. And um, they used the fit and then um, they, I'm sorry, they used the HPLC data in order to correlate the fit of the peak maximums and develop the relationship that was to uh, decompose or deconvolve the absorption spectra and to be able to describe the phytoplankton functional group. So this really is um, taking a method of taking the absorption data and breaking it apart to be able to look at the small features and and detail out what the phytoplankton functional group is in the environment. And this really has a large power for understanding um, the phytoplankton ecology, a bloom dynamics, the potential of presence of harmful algal blooms, um, and, and perhaps even um, understanding the, the contribution of phytoplankton to, to biomass. But, but what was done here was um, link the, the relationship between the extracted pigments, that's HPLC data, so that was really the single source of truth from discrete measurements to that peak wavelength that was um, chosen for each Gaussian fit. And as you can see here, um, there's a pretty good relationship. And for most of these, um, there was a goodness of fit from a Spearman rank correlation of greater than eight. So it was really a good, a good way of, of building that relationship. And so really there is a good relationship between the Gaussian derived phytoplankton functional groups and that which can be obtained by the, the pigments themselves. And so what's the impact here? Um, there's a really large impact in terms of understanding. So I'm gonna show you what the potential is. I'm gonna play a little video and I believe there's some sort of like nice soothing yoga sound to it. But um, really this is helping us uh, understand the broader impacts of phytoplankton um, in the globe. So with this, this is actually a model um, from uh, uh, MIT and uh, MLML that is called the Darwin model. Um, and it's looking at simulating spectral absorption and attenuation um, from satellite data. And so it's really looking at the water column constituents and it's trying to break apart the, the phytoplankton functional groups Prochlorococcus, Senecococcus, Flagellus, and the, the diatoms. So these are four functional groups. And it's looking over time and space and, and helping uh, describe how changes of phytoplankton occur in, in the globe. Now, data collected from the ACS in situ can be used to validate such models. And really, with this in situ and model data, we can gain more insight into the contribution of phytoplankton to the global climate budget and uh, population dynamics and really understanding um, perhaps even the initiation of blooms and their contribution to um, the climate and their relationship to the environment. You get the rest of the music if you go to the thing. Yeah. <laughs> get the yoga pose. Oh, wait. Sorry. Key take home here. We'll go back to this. Forget the music. But um, one of the things that was really important in, in showing that model, the Darwin model, is that it's, it's one of the models as from an early adopter um, for the PACE satellite. And so mm. if you look at the coming back full circle, we are working with a group of scientists to invent the newest radiometers that are going to be used to calibrate that satellite. And so we're playing a role in making sure that those models are accurate. And we can do that in two ways. We can do that using radiometers and we can do that in situ as well using the ACS. And those are deployed uh, 2024? The ocean color sensor, I believe, is going to launch in 2024. And we've been using the older satellites for some decades. Yep. I think the whole color in the ocean has been dominated. What wavelengths and what people are interested in 
right. by that whole program, you know, and I think that helped us develop what wavelengths we would offer in some of the sensors and all that. Yep, and, and it's going hyperspectral as well. So it has um, about a 10x uh, increase in the number of spectral properties that it can obtain uh, from the Ocean Color Imager. And I think that that's one of the most powerful tools that we're going to have to be able to understand the ocean dynamics. Um, and just, you know, for those who don't study specifically phytoplankton, um, the whole program is designed to, or is, is intent is to look at both the atmospheric spectral contribution as well as the oceanographic. Yeah. Just a quick follow up to that, to the pace. Yeah. Um, so our team is working on a project with uh, multiple trips to Antarctica coming up in the next few years. Yeah. And we've been encouraged to, um, to develop something that could help calibrate the pace data in the polar regions, or yeah. in Antarctica. Um, and so we're evaluating different options. Yeah. Um, you know, the ship has, you know, CTD um, capability, but we're also looking at uh, putting out ice tethered instruments with a satellite link mm -hmm. uh, to monitor change over time because, you know, it's so hard to, to get any data over the winter time. Yeah. So I was just curious, you know, with this issue about the ACS needing to be clean or any instrument flow through yeah. data needing to be cleaned out. Um, what would you recommend for like a long-term monitoring thing when you, know, when you see ice? That's a great question. I, even, a, I mean, even a few months of data would actually be great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be impressive to get. Um, you know, I, I don't know anything off offhand. I mean, I know that one of the ways that we overcome it with the HyperNav is that it's autonomous and it parks itself at a thousand meters. So the advantage is kind of hiding outside of the euphotic zone. Um, and I'm, I would have to think about what a good mitigation strategy would be for the, the Arctic, um, but I don't have one offhand. I mean, I, yeah, the wind. Maybe one example is there's uh, typical algo floats, you know, park uh, in the sea ice uh, over, the, over the winter and some of them come back after a long period of time, which is still good data uh, on the CPD side. So probably, one mitigation strategy is to stay out outside of the, the really active uh, zone, you know, like she said, park at 1,000 meters where there's hardly any uh, contamination happening, and then just do profile measurements. So there's, there's a sea owl, which is that little silver, um, like, fluorometer and, um, and particle sensor and all uh, the sea owl and whatnot. That's on the, the, our, the BGC, the Argo floats. Um, and that's giving uh, chlorophyll and CDOM, FDOM, and uh, some scattering. And it, it doesn't seem to have the same challenges um, as some of the constituents that, um, or some of the surfaces that are plumbed. Um, so I guess, Time will tell how much we will or won't be able to, how long those can or can't exist, but uh, they're on there for a good reason. Uh, probably the best, the best strategy that we have at the moment to, to put those on there. Um, but if, I have a, a question back is, on those systems, would those be flow through systems, remote flow through systems and stuff that are kind of um, automatically pulling in samples and flowing them and all that sort of thing? If, if that's the case, then I think there's a lot of people that are interested in the same challenge where they could flush cleaning agents through. I know there's uh, people in, in Europe and Spain and stuff that want to use um, some sort of oxalic acid, <laughs> some sort of solution that will flush through all the tubing and all the stuff um, and clean it. And they're a little concerned about what the effects of that will be on the instruments. And I think for the most part, unless you're doing like pH or something like that, um, I think the idea is as long as it's not super concentrated or other things. So I think there's some long-term challenges that are, scientists will, will always find a pretty good way of trying to, trying to figure out a problem, right? So I think we're gonna get there at some point. Uh, there's a lot of people and, and ever since I've been around, people have been trying to figure out how to, how to handle biofouling, right? 
So, you know, we've got uh, some of the ecos will have these, these wipers, you know, and so that is basically uh, the kind of the most basic way we try to attack that. We put some copper surfaces, things can't grow on there, stuff like that. But um, so that's kind of a passive, sort of a passive approach to keeping stuff from growing. Uh, it doesn't keep stuff from like growing right on here and hanging over, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Um, so th there's other ways you have to, you know, wrap things and sometimes you can't use copper in sensitive areas. So now what, you know, so I think there's a lot of people um, very interested in trying to figure out that problem. Are you, are you thinking of mode application or is it uh, kind of an autonomous kind of mode application? Yeah, for, for the monitoring problem, we're, we're looking at an ice tether system. So you can drill a hole yeah. and then have a okay. surface to be, and then use an induction modem. I see. So real time. Yeah. For, for real time. Yeah. It, right now, it only has a CTD and velocity, mm -hmm. but we're thinking about adding. So you, you think yeah. about profiling that, or just yes. having it? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, in a similar environment, the Victoria Hill at um, Old Dominion University um, is <coughs> utilizing eco fluorometer and backscatter sensors um, in a MORT application as well. And I'm not I'm, my my assumption is it's just uh, does not have a bio wiper, um, but she may have some ideas uh, in terms of overcoming. She's deploying them in the Antarctic. No, sorry. She's deploying them in the Arctic. You're in the Antarctic. That's where you wanted to go. Um, and uh, but I know she may have some of the similar constraints. Yeah, thank you. yeah. I think the inductive modem uh, if you have a serial sensor, there's uh, a way to connect those to the to the column of, of data up the rods um, that can take ECOs and other things and see stars or whatever makes sense to deploy. Uh, I think that's still a possibility as far as taking any serial instrument and making it an IM instrument, if that's and helpful at all. Yeah. I'll, I'll add like this one isn't ideal, but a potential is, you know, you take a pre and post calibration and that's, you know, you're assume uh, some, lin let's just, I'm just gonna say linear change due to fouling that you can correct as long as you have the pre and post, um, post bio fouling data. And that's a very gross correction, but that may also be um, a good way for you to start. Yeah, that's, that's great. Okay. We can, we're hoping to get the post calibration opportunity that mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. designed to be expendable. And get right. Yeah. That's exactly but, what. Yeah. But we're, we're hoping to find a spot yep. that won't break up. Yep. So we yeah. Yeah. Got it. That's the that's, ideal. <laughs> yeah, that's, the ideal. <laughs> that's almost the exact <laughs> scenario that uh, the Arctic example is that they're losing it also. It's just breaking off in the ice. Yeah. Well deserved swag for the question. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Everyone will take it. Yeah. Was there any specific motivation to use a sail power path as opposed to. Gosh, no. I would have to tell you, I would direct you to the Tara website. We just have, um, we had the opportunity to have both the ACS white light or the ACS LED and the, and the incandescent through our partnerships. Um, this is actually an initiative through the French government um, to utilize, um, I would say, I think the premise is a more sustainable way of do sh doing oceanography using a sailboat than it, and, um, and traversing the globe than it would be using uh, your standard oceanographic vessel. Yeah. It is, I, it's ship of opportunities in air quotes. This is a full research vessel that's fully outfitted it's with been it. Running it's for been running for years. almost four or five years. And this is directed by the French government, but it's a, I mean, like you want to be inspired. I go there and just hang out. Like it's a super cool it's, website it's and they're doing amazing work. San Diego and then, and then been docked somewhere. Um, I know Portland and other places I got the chance to jump on there. Yeah. And, um, and meet, I do, meet sorry, those guys. I yeah. threw that as an, as an inspiration. I'm like, that's kind of like really sexy. Ocean it's a, kind of a nonprofit. <laughs> I think it, it's a, it's comprised of a lot of different, a couple, few different organizations and stuff. There's a board and all yeah. that. Yeah. But uh, they have a 24 seven year round, year, year to year, taking stuff off, trying to ship stuff to 
BFE somewhere and um, you know it's pretty challenging uh, and they have a very strict uh, strict uh, schedule of when they want stuff back you know that sort of thing but it is kind of a neat lens to what's going on with them but you know it's, it's a very uh, a lot of diff a lot of experience went into that inline system uh, which uh, I, I am pretty amazed at. <laughs> uh, so it if, uh, if please please give us your information and I think we might have it already from the attendance and whatnot but um, we can work with some of that so thank you guys very much for I the think honor there were some of being other able questions to, that we oh, had to field. Do you want to do you want to just answer the question? I just wanted to make sure that we thanked before we ran out of time, Vanessa and Cannon. We just ran out of time, but Oh yeah. <laughs> for, well, you can go over. I mean, I don't think they're going to the big bell. I mean, I thought that was the end. <laughs> <laughs> I got my class to get to. Uh, like we're going to start the gong soon, and it's over. Yeah. Know, Dave, do I you know. have? Do we have the questions I written down? I don't have them. We actually sent a survey out. Make sure we cover those. Um, the first one is, how are you adapting your instrumentation to be deployed and operated by uncrewed autonomous systems? And I'm not sure exactly who asked the question, but uh, Chris, do you want to? Did I have that one? Yeah, yes. sure. I thought we had. Uh, that was the HyperNav. Well, again, the HyperNav, um, and I think the HyperNav actually has a lot of instrumentation. So I'm I'm showing the HyperNav dual-headed radiometer, but it's on the Navis platform. So those two things are actually separate. And on the Navis platform are an MCOMS, eco, uh, MCOMS uh, chlorophyll and scattering sensors. Did I, did we, did that, was that the answer that we? Yeah, I think definitely Navis is, is one autonomous platform, you know, the float, you know, and uh, the Navis is capable of carrying biogeochemical sensors. So it's not, not just optical sensors, it's pH, it's oxygen. Obviously, the standard CTD. Uh, that's, that's Where are you going? There. Uh, we had other sensors um, integrated on, on some autonomous platforms, you know, that's CTDs and uh, maybe just to the hyper soon as which is a nitrate uh, measurement on, on gliders. Yeah. Um, that's, that's other platforms where we have integrated our instruments, uh, even on a cell drone, I believe, uh, microcat uh, with a specific firmware that allows for faster sampling was uh, deployed. There's uh, nitrate sensor, uh, pH. Yeah. Did you mention that already? Yeah, yeah. I, I missed the um, nitrate, yeah. Yep, yeah, nitrate sensor, CO, like, like down here. This is what we're seeing. Um, the radio, uh, there's a, a PAR, uh, that's the satellite. No, that's a four channel OCR. That's, that's not I, just PAR. That's what I meant, that's what I meant. Okay. OCR, uh, and then the CTD stuff, the head, you know, it's got the temperature connectivity and all that stuff in there. And then the, Thanks, Dave. Uh, another question was, um, what are fluorometer options to replace the wet star? Uh, I think there was a flow system needed that can send up yeah. fire. Was that your question, uh, potentially? No. I think there was, is Kayla around? Anyway, I, I, I think there was a, a question about how to replace the wet star, which is an, a, an inline fluorometer with something else. Uh, I don't know. If, did someone here ask that question? Okay, uh, it was basically the whole idea that we went through on the inline and the cleaning and all that sort of thing. But I think, so there's, uh, there's basically uh, the eco with the shutter is really the replacement for a wet star inline. Uh, the 16 plus that the person was talking about is a CTD that uh, has uh, firmware controls on it to um, give the, to have a delay uh, for the wiper to move, and then it samples what's going on with the chlorophyll uh, sensor and, and double channel or single channel uh, if you want turbidity or chlorophyll, whatever. Um, but it's got firmware involved, uh, so you get the timing just right, you can get the wiper to move, all that sort of thing. So I think that's a pretty active, a pretty, um, that's one of our favorite, I guess, go-tos if you need a moored and a chlorophyll sensor um, like that. Thanks, Dave. Another question was incorporation of new sensors in CTDs, and that is a very general question. <laughs> I'm not sure who asked that, uh, but uh, so <laughs> if it's a 
anybody on the group here, please uh, can elaborate I, I, what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I have to, because I, I work in sensors. Yeah. But now we're working on a uh, iron activity sensor. Yeah. For obvious reasons, because of the potential iron limitation in the ocean. And it's a uh, inline uh, sensor. Yeah. Uh, there are other sensors that are very similar, but can be directed towards other uh, elements. And uh, that would be a good thing to do. Inline meaning pumped? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Well, well, you can attach to the hull. You know, you don't have to even pump. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. I mean, ultimately, the, those kind of developments come from collaboration with, with researchers like you, you know, exactly. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's the nature of things. I think the most recent one we integrated like this was probably the pH sensor, which is a very difficult sensor to integrate because it's flow dependent, so, and, uh, but this, this one is harder. This one's even harder. Okay, we're still working on the pH side. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I worked with Todd Marks. Oh, you work with mm -hmm. Dogmark. Okay. I think alkalinity is an ex another example, you know, yeah. that in order to really kind of close the problem cycle, that would be a mm -hmm. center that would probably would be very useful. Yeah, uh, and you know, we have, well, not I wasn't here then, but the, uh, they have these strides in this lab. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Ellen Briggs uh, right, working yeah. uh, on, on, uh, on the alkalinity sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely some, some progress in that regard. Yeah, so we're definitely interested in, in these developments. But ultimately, we're trying to make instrumentation that, that helps you solve the problems. So. Yeah, there's there's cycles of how uh, responsive we are or aren't. <laughs> so, you know, there might be specific examples of, oh my gosh, I never got my question, you know, I've got this challenge, blah, blah, blah. But um, just keep keep poking at those things and I think we, we need to be listening uh, very carefully about all you this know, stuff. Yeah. Oh. I, I worked as a Navy oceanographer for 30 years, 31 years, and uh, ships that go out in the ocean hardly follow at all. <laughs> ships that sit in the bay follow yes. almost immediately, yeah. and they have to be cleaned every three months. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the big difference is the turbulence at, mm -hmm. at, the, at the very surface. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, why don't you line your tubes with a corrugated Teflon, mm -hmm. and then Speed up the flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we definitely actually rely on, on turbulence uh, uh, in the measurement just to reduce effects of uh, boundary layers within the tubing. You know, that's that's a big thing because it will affect your response time of the temperature and the conductivity sensors, things like that. So it's actually important to have turbulence in there. And uh, yeah. the dimensioning yeah. and the geometry is chosen for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you really Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is, oh, yeah. I, it's a good point. We had that before. <laughs> oh, I, I messed it all yeah, up. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> exactly. Our office hours are uh, somewhere around here. Or tomorrow from one to three. Yeah. And you don't have to limit yourself to technical questions. Yeah. Well, I'll be there. Come talk to us about, yeah, Seabird. Say hi. There will be drinks and snacks, not keto. So eat all the keto today, no keto tomorrow. And thank you for your time. Thank you again. Hello.